Welcome to Encounters, New Perspectives on Asia, America and Europe. My name is Barbara Mittler. I'm director or founding director of CATS No Longer, the Center for Asian and Transcultural Studies. Um, and with my colleague, Well Werner, who is director of the Heidelberg Center for American Studies, I would like to briefly introduce to you, especially those who have not yet been part of it, this dialogue series that we started about a year ago, it jointly initiated by our two institutes. Um, the events in this series focus on the relationship between the two great superpowers of the 21st century, the United States of America and the People's Republic of China. With the stunning rise of this People's Republic of China in recent decades, this relationship has become increasingly contentious. The balloon affair does not help, and you can see how it's contentious. China's growing self-confidence is a challenge to the US and its allies alike. And thus, it also embroils Europe in this new trans-Pacific geopolitical rivalry. While Europe's security continues to be guaranteed by the United States, its economic ties to China have grown considerably over the last decades. As a result, the European Union and its individual member states are looking for a safe haven somewhere in this simmering conflict. It is our conviction, therefore, that we need to know more about these two nations uh, that will shape the world of the 21st century and that we need to deepen our understanding of their complex relationship. Our series of encounters, therefore, is intended to offer a forum for discussion of multifaceted challenges in which a deeper understanding of Asian and American cultural heritage will play an important role. We hope that these dialogues will thus contribute to an informed debate on one of the most imminent challenges for Germany and Europe. Increases China competence of which everybody is talking at this point in time. Um, at the same time as increasing our US competence. How do we envisage doing this? Encounters brings prominent Chinese and American policymakers, as well as authors, artists, activists, public intellectuals, and representatives from the business communities to Heidelberg University. We have had US presidential advisor Fiona Hill from the US, as well as former Ministry of Minister of Culture and well-known author of prose and fiction, Nongying Tai, from Taiwan, Reinhard Beauty Kofa, member of the Green Party at the European Parliament, and Pato Yen, Hong Kong activist and dramatist, and many more. We're engaging our guests in a dialogue with scholars from the CATS and the HCA, the Heidelberg Center for American Studies, in order to allow nuanced discussions on a wide range of controversial topics that are shaping the exceptional relationship between the US as the established and the People's Republic of China as the emerging superpower. They wouldn't consider it this way, but anyway. We are zooming in on issues such as China's middle class, the role of the intellectuals, visions of a new global order, including discussions on the environmental crisis, trade wars, questions of technology transfer and innovation, white collar crime, digital surveillance, as well as the larger issues of human rights and freedom of expression. In order to provide multiple perspectives on China-US relations, we have and will consider different Chinese voices from the mainland, as well as from Taiwan and Hong Kong. We also offer contrasting American perspectives from politics to the economy and the arts. As we analyze the emerging political and geostrategic constellations in our multipolar world with these two strong rivals and discuss their consequences for Germany and Europe. How do the European Union and its member states position themselves in the competition between China and the US? What are their current positions and strategies? What will the future bring to this new global landscapes? Our encounters will seek answers to these questions and we thank you already now for joining us in what we hope to be a series of inspiring exchanges. But now, without further ado, let me hand over to Wel Berner, who will introduce to you today's dialogue partners, Biao Xiang uh, from the MPI for Social Anthropology in Halle, and Manfred Berg from the Department of History and the Heidelberg Center for American Studies. They will discuss on Valentine's Day the somewhat fitting question of the love-hate relationship between the US and the PRC 
ambition and frustration in fragile societies. I really thought that's fitting for Valentine's Day. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, Thank you, Barbara. Good evening and welcome once more to Encounters. My name is Wel Ferner. I'm the director of the Heidelberg Center for American Studies. And it is my great pleasure to introduce the participants of tonight's event. It is an honor to welcome uh, Biao Chang to Heidelberg University Center for Asian and Transcultural Studies. Biao comes to us from the Max Planck Institute for Social Anthropology in Halle where he is head of the department Anthropology of Economic Experimentation. Biao Shang studies sociology at Beijing University in China and received his PhD in social anthropology from the University of Oxford in the UK. He was professor of social anthropology at Oxford before he joined the MPI in 2021. Biao Chang's main research addresses various types of migration and mobility in China, India, and other parts of Asia. Through the lens of migration, he has examined a wide range of political economy issues concerning state-society relations, labor, social reproduction, and mobility governance. Biao Chang is the winner of the 2008 Anthony Leeds Prize for his book, Global Body Shopping, and the 2012 William L. Holland Prize for his article, Predatory Princes. Under the title, Chinese Transcending Boundaries, he published an analysis of a migrant village in Beijing in an English translation in 2005. The open access book, Self as Method, co-authored with Wu Qi, was ranked the most impactful book 2020 in China, according to the website Dubin. Biu Chang's ideas regularly generate wide discussions in China and beyond. His work has been translated into Japanese, French, Korean, Spanish, German, and Italian. Joining Biu Chang on stage at the CATS tonight is Manfred Berg one of the HCA's deputy directors. Since 2005, he has held the Kurt Engelhorn Chair in American History at Heidelberg University. Previously, he taught at Freie Universität Berlin, Universität zu Köln, and Friedrich Alexander Universität Erlangen-Nürnberg. He also spent five years as a research fellow at the German Historical Institute in Washington, D.C. Manfred Berg's research and teaching revolves around Afri African-American history, the history of mob violence, and the history of U.S. foreign relations. Among his numerous publications are The Ticket to Freedom, The National Association for the Advancement of Colored People and the Struggle for Black Political Integration, published in 2005, and Popular Justice, A History of Lynching in America, which came out in 2011. He is currently working on a book entitled A House Divided, A History of the United States Since the 1960s, which traces the history of polarization in the U.S. Yao and Manfred, we are very much looking forward to your thoughts on ambition and frustration, as you already mentioned in fragmented societies. The floor is yours. So we have to manage ourselves now. <laughs> Why don't you begin? <laughs> OK. <laughs> That's a very wise <laughs> managerial style, yeah. So um, we agreed that uh, I would just uh, talk about uh, uh, five or 10 minutes about my thought questions and then Matthew that will follow. And the most importantly, we want to open the floor and uh, to hear your views about this quite important question for both of us. Uh, the big question is that the social crisis in China and the 
U.S. And then we wonder whether or not we can address this question, broader question through a more specific topic, which is ambition, mobility, equality, etc. But in my, my focus is more about uh, ambition. Um, I wish to, I wanted to make a point about the method. Today, we, of course, we wanted to make comparison between China and the US. And I'm an anthropologist, and, uh, which is a discipline that is almost naturally associated with the method of comparison, comparison across culture and uh, societies. Uh, but in my department in Halle, uh, our slogan is that we do not do comparison. What we do is interreferencing. Comparison means that there's A and B, and I take a position C, and the C is beyond and above A and B. So I'm a scholar, so I see there's a pattern A and a pattern B, so I compare what's the differences and what's the similarities. Interreferencing inter is a method that says there's no position of C. Where is C? You are either in A or you are B. For most people who are deeply worried about the situation in the US or China, then you must know what life is like inside of that society. If you remove yourself from the living conditions and you try to summarize, stabilize all the life and social contradiction into certain patterns, in my view, from an anthropological perspective, probably will, will miss a lot. So interreferencing is that we deeply root, firmly ground ourselves in one particular local condition. But we think of the local conditions in a way that is informed by our observation and analysis of other contexts. So therefore, we don't lose this local attachment, the depth, but at the same time, we don't confine ourselves to the particular local context, so the interreferencing. And interreferencing is what the people do every day. You know, people in, uni in the Heidelberg University probably will think, okay, what the free university is doing? I was just asking you about the American studies in different universities. And we are actually not making comparison. When we're thinking of that way, we're doing interreferencing because we are thinking, oh, colleagues in free university are doing this and that. What does that mean to me? How I can do things differently? Hmm? And what is a, a, the problem I'm now facing? It is through interreferencing, so therefore, we become subject. We become a thinking subject, and we can inform our next step of, of action. So that is different from more scholarly comparison, which is somehow we elevate ourselves to the sky and the sea. Oh, you know, there's pattern A, pattern B. But then you don't see all this the, 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 the internal contradiction, the practices, which is very difficult to be summarized in certain formula. So that is a spirit that, that I suppose today, it's, it's a, uh, the main point is not to say, oh, China, you are similar or not, but I, I'm thinking of you, China, I'm thinking, okay, so this is the question the Chinese people face. Then what, how did American people face in the 1960s or in the 1930s, right, which is more, probably more comparable to what happened in China now? And then how that question was, was de dealt with? So that's not a comparison, but it's in, in, interreferencing. There's a different perspective to that question. And then, th that's a point one. Point two is that uh, uh, what is uh, the, uh, the uh, social crisis China is facing now in my analysis. If we look at all the specific problems, I think there are lots of similarities between China and the US, inequality, and uh, the loss of public trust, and the mental stress. But of course, China probably don't have racial tension, et cetera. But that is kind of a more, uh, uh, you can say it's due to specific historical reasons, et cetera. But there are lots of issues that are very similar. But that, for me, is not the most important thing. Because the most important thing is that how the different problems come together, forming a whole. So even you can have a laundry list of questions, which you, know, you can see that this list is shared by China, Europe, the US. But they feel very different. 
in different countries. As anthropologists, we try to capture the feeling inside of the different societies, how inequality, for instance, in China, inequality will feel very acute pressure to perform, to move up. Probably in the US, in some, uh, for certain groups, inequality will mean a certain sense of fear. Fear of you know, losing out or fear being becoming the target of resentment. So that's a quite different, but they're both, if you look at the statistics, they're the same, but they feel very different. So how to put these things, the specific question together? I mean, this is the job of, of anthropologists. I believe it's also a job of a probably historian because you give us a big narrative. Right? So this is a function of narrative. So China, I think a big, one of the biggest challenges is what I call the orderly social decay. So there's a lots of problems. But then you look at the site as a whole, it's quite orderly by and large. So orderly, of course, number one is the absence, the relative absence of chaos or disorder. You know, life goes on, even though there's a lot of problems, people are happy, but you know, it's very predictable. Uh, the bus will be, will, will be running and etc. There's a no and a very clear antagonism. Number one is the absence of disorderness, but number two, so the entire society, if you look at people's life and et cetera, is also very ordered. In China, you have this, uh, I mean, that is special in China, the ageism. Young people are deeply worried about their own age from the age of 20. Because you know, if you're in high tech sec sector, by the age of 35, you feel it's the end of your career. Mm -hmm. So many people from China will know what I mean. And especially for women. So that the age is, 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 is something brutal they have to fight against. What does it mean? It means your life is extremely ordered. You have to follow the script, right? So that, and then is the problem is a social decay. And this, I borrow this term from a Chinese sociologist, the Sun Liping. And he said that China is not facing danger of social collapse, not a social implosion, right? Like one day, I mean, it's a, everything. Uh, uh, collapse and, and, and uh, widespread riots. No, that is not likely to happen. But what happening is decay. People losing trust, losing the connectedness with other people, and gradually people become cynical, feel lonely. I mean, they don't necessarily go to the street. I mean, of course, in China, the practically, it's impossible for you to go to the street in a large number anyway. Uh, but then you, 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 you lose the meaning of life bit by bit. Right? The society becomes just like a person very, you know, have a chronic illness. The body decay gradually, losing energy, losing the force of innovation and etc. And that is what we see uh, uh, in China. So that is my characterization of the problem of China. So that my final point is that how we, I try to think about that is that I want to think through the notion of ambition. The so question is that how individual ambition is socially organized, how a particular mode that individual ambition is socially organized that turn ambition into sense of powerlessness. And the key here I want to call it is a privatization of ambition. In China, ambition started as a collective group. So, I mean, that's a bit of a history because it's a large civilization at the end of the 19th century when they came, uh, acquired this kind of modern consciousness of self. It is under the Western hegemony. So there is this feeling that, okay, we have come together. We have to catch up with the rest of the world, claim our rightful place in the world. So that's a collective ambition which dominated China's development until actually beginning of 1990s. But after that, you have a private ambition that the ambition become a private matter. But the trick here is that the narrative of collective ambition did not go away. It translated into a state ambition. So now what we see is that the private ambition is often justified by state ambition. And then probably there are too many details and that create lots of very peculiar situation. I just will give one example. Why the Chinese people work so hard? They kind of, they, 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 they're brutal, brutal towards themselves, eh? the, the Chinese education system, etc. Because they are using a rich set of discourse, 
which is associated with the collective issue. For example, catch up. You know, you, 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 we, we are humiliated by, by foreigners, so we have to work very hard. And there's a notion of the temporal urgency. Huh? It's, it's a, every minute is, is a vital, is absolutely vital. You cannot waste a single minute. And that is coming from socialist legacy, but now is appropriated by the private purpose. And so somehow the ideology could justify itself, but that without addressing the real life experience that now you are individual, pursue your own ambition. So they cannot help you to understand the relation between you and your classmates. How do you deal with this interpersonal competition? This part become a kind of almost a jungle society. Hmm? But then they use a very grotified, abstract ideology to justify personal ambition without addressing the actual practice. And that lead to uh, 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 ultra-nationalism, lead to authoritarian government style, also lead to lots of mental stress at individual level. So, I mean, so that, for me, that's a very particular Pe uh, peculiar transition of pri privatization of ambition is something I'm quite interested in, and I think probably there's lots of things we can learn from the American experience. Can you hear me? Thank you. Yeah, let me first of all thank you all for including me. Uh, I must admit I do not really know much about China. Uh, and uh, But from what from listening to you, I think there's actually quite a few comparisons we could make. Um, and uh, I'd like to pick up the thread, collect, when you, you were using the terms collective and individual ambition. Of course, individual ambition is the American dream. The American dream that in, in the United States, in American society, you find a plain level and you can have equal opportunity. You can make it if you work hard, you're smart, have a little luck. Uh, and that's the social contract that keeps American society together, namely individual ambition. Uh, now, a lot of scholars speak about the crisis of the American dream. And I just, rather than engaging in multiple figures and statistics here, just point out that uh, about 10 years ago, an economist who's unfortunately uh, deceased in the meantime, who was a chief advisor to President Barack Obama, Alan Kruger, published what he called the Great Gatsby Curve. And that is a curve that combines parameters that measure economic inequality and social mobility across generations. And from the perspective of the American dream, it came to a devastating conclusion because the United States, not only, that comes as no surprise, have the highest rates of social and economic inequality in the Western world, but also the lowest, uh, the lowest intergenerational uh, mobility. So the idea that the United States is a society which tolerates economic inequality because social mobility is so high is nothing but a myth, basically. And of course, what we've seen, and I don't have really have to go into the details here, but um, the latest since the advent of the Great Recession, uh, this has translated into what political scientists call a populist revolt. And uh, in many ways, I would argue that Donald Trump's rise has a lot to do with that uh, uh, rising inequality, that lack of opportunity and participation. Uh, um, and uh, at the same time, um, there is a peculiar uh, tinge to it because uh, in other societies, you might expect that this leads to collective protests along that really question capitalism. Uh, this is obviously not the case uh, in America. And uh, what we really see here is that a declining white middle class that feels uh, betrayed, uh, cheated out of, out of its American dream 
follows a populist leader who is a ruthless businessman, uh, but in, a, in the same way uh, he might be classified as the incarnation of the American dream, at least that's the way he presents himself. Uh, and also, as someone called him, is the a poor man's idea of a rich man. Um, and he gets away with everything, basically. He's been bragging about that. Um, so uh, what, we, what I see in American society in terms of a crisis is, uh, on the one hand, is a political protest. On the other hand, we also see social phenomena that, at least at the surface, do not really, we, we, we do not necessarily connect to a crisis of the American dream, but if you take a closer look, they're actually very closely connected. Take the mass shootings, often called as senseless violence, uh, but that's not really, it, they, they can be explained. America, by the way, is the world leader, comes as no surprise, has more than 30% of all mass shootings worldwide and 5% of world population. Of course, access to firearms, might play a role. It's just a wild guess, but um, what we, what, what, what criminologists argue is that what, what's really reflected in these mass shootings is are the overblown and frustrated ambition, particularly of young men. Ninety-nine percent of all perpetrators are male. Again, no surprise here, um, and uh, it, it, it's no coincidence that. What we often see, it's the sites of these mass shootings, schools, universities, job, uh, uh, workplaces. Uh, they have a lot, lot to do with uh, individual uh, experiences of uh, these frustrated um, ambitions. So I think here is actually a lot of room for, uh, for anthropologists to, to do a little bit of thick descriptions and... Uh, not necessarily participating observation. I would definitely advise against that. Uh, can get you killed. But um, so from, an, uh, um, from the perspective of someone who specializes in studying US politics and, and society, looking at China, what I'd be particularly interested in is the following question. And you also alluded to this. Uh, it seems to me that the social contract of the Chinese middle class for the past decades or so was predicated on, a, uh, on the promise, you can get rich if you work hard, kind of a Chinese version of the American dream, as long as you're politically quiet. Uh, and now what, we, what we've been observing in uh, recent years years under uh, the rule of Xi Jinping is a return to ideology, a re-ideologization, uh, and uh, also a much more authoritarian uh, rule. And I wonder to what extent that translates into frustrated ambitions and how long that social contract will hold up uh, and will not produce uh, political unrest. So great, yeah. So I think before I address that question, I wanted to, uh, to go back to uh, what I mentioned, the orderly social decay that resonates with uh, what uh, Manfred Fred said, uh, uh, the, the unrest in, in I mean, it's, a, it's a, a sharp contrast to that because you ask the question, why these people did not uh, stand up uh, the protest capitalism, but the rather you know, middle class failed, they are being cheated out from the system, and then you have frustrated individuals uh, that take up quite extreme uh, reaction. And then you can also see the, the racial and the class, even sometimes the regional uh, uh, divide in a quite a confrontational manner in the US. Uh, that is very interesting to me because I feel China is almost completely absent of all this uh, confrontation. 
So there is lots of problems beneath uh, the surface, surface, but by and large, it is still orderly. And then the reason is, in the Chinese society, up to now, every individual feel, and they still hope, they will benefit from the collective development. And they have the sense of hope. And then they also know they are contributing to the current problem. For, ins for instance, excessive competition. All the parents have nightmare in China. Are you going to send your kids to extra uh, tuition and etc.? They say, okay, no, of course, not good for kids. Of course, that's not good for education system. But how dare I opt out from the system, right? If I don't send my kids to tuition, my kids will lag behind in the class, and the, the kids will suffer. So everyone knows they are contributing to the problem. And then they don't find a way to free themselves from the, 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 the system. So everyone is very tightly locked into uh, this self perpetuating self-perpetuating and uh, quite a vicious cycle. So somehow US is a kind of more a break up <laughs> a, 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 a problem, if, uh, though they have not diagnosed, diagnosed the, the correct cause of a problem, but, uh, but, uh, but it's not like everyone's locked into a self-perpetuating uh, mechanism. And then that's related to, to the question whether or not uh, the middle class in China will feel, have a sense of um, betrayed and have a sense of frustration, which will lead to more uh, radicalized reaction. Uh, my answer is probably no. And uh, number one, the, the uh, kind of the middle class in China is uh, not a very, I mean, it can be used as a descriptive concept. But whether or not there is a lot of people have this kind of consciousness, okay, I'm a middle class, I have this entitlement, if this thing happen, I feel it is a kind of existential threat which I have to uh, stand up against. Uh, uh, there's no such a sentiment. And, uh, and this is related to the Chinese socialist ideology, uh, I must emphasize, because China's reform and open up is a mass campaign movement because the reform started in the countryside. The people who benefit the most during the reform in the first 10 years are peasants. So the middle class actually came only later. So that up to now, it is still very collective. But it's a very privatized, individualized pursuit, but in a huge collective game. So that is what makes China special. And also explains why the economy grows so fast up to now. Uh, so there is such a, a, a uh, uh, no very strong, uh, uh, kind of class consciousness. So therefore the idea of social contract uh, is not so salient uh, either. Then you have group of people, entrepreneurs, you know, very successful ones, of course, they are all migrating to the US. They feel they, you know, they, they don't want to stay in China. Uh, there's a so-called Chinese term called the run philosophy. Basically the philosophy of outer migration, how to run away. But there's a very small number of people and their first option is to run away rather than stay on to, to fight. Uh, so that's, uh, so I think that's the, 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 for me the biggest the puzzle is still somehow the Chinese society, people feel the problem, see the social decay, but everyone is continuing contributing to the decay and without being able to find the alternative at either individual level or, or collective level. So that is, is the, probably the biggest difference between China and the US. Well, just an illustration of how these ambitions, these educational ambitions mm -hmm. translate and transfer into American society. Um, a recent lawsuit that has made its way up to the U.S. Supreme Court uh, on uh, affirmative action uh, was brought by Chinese Americans against the affirmative action program of Harvard. And uh, it is basically 
predicated on the, the case is predicated on the argument that affirmative action is unfair be, to Chinese because if it were purely on a meritocratic yes. uh, basis, then there would be many more Chinese admitted to Harvard. Uh, so this is, in a way, the argument that uh, whites for quite a long time uh, brought uh, against um, uh, affirmative um, action. Um, I was wondering, though, um, I'm also worth in, in the book that uh, Welf was generous enough to mention, I also inquire into uh, the demographic transition in the United States. And this is really stunning, and i just give you a ballpark number here. In um, the census of 1960, uh, the Bureau of the Census counts slightly below 90% of the US population identifying as Euro-American. And the rest, what was still called Negro at the time, African-Americans. Other ethnic groups are not even uh, salient in those statistics. Now, in 2020, the, um, the share, population share of Euro-Americans has dropped to 58%. And by all projections, in 2045, they'll be it'll drop below uh, 50%. And this is, of course, a, a, a transition with profound consequences on the self-image of Americans as a relatively homogeneous white middle-class society, which dominated the boom years after the Second World War. Uh, and now, there is a completely different, uh, particularly a completely different future in stock in the eyes of uh, many uh, white Americans. And uh, I think that is, a, uh, is also a, a factor that needs to be taken into consideration. If you consider, uh, let's say, individual ambition and advancement in society, a zero-sum game, which many people do, for better or worse, uh, then this also translates into competition yeah. between ethnic groups. Mm -hmm. Now, again, I apologize for my ignorance, but every now and then I read a paper. And um, I, um, I just like to sort of not challenge, but just uh, add a question to what you said about China being... Uh, homogeneous society that has no ethnic conflict. Uh, we read about uh, ethnic conflicts um, every now and then in certain parts of uh, China. So I wonder uh, whether to, or to what extent that self-image mm. is, um, is partly reality and partly self-deception or a myth. Mm. No, no, that's a great question. I mean, the ethnic uh, uh, conflicts, actually, I mean, they, 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 let's put it bluntly, there is now becoming ethnic conflicts in China. It's no longer some delicate ethnic relation, but now becoming ethnic conflicts, particularly uh, regarding uh, Tibet and the Xinjiang, uh, is becoming much worse uh, over the last uh, 10 years. Um, this is number one, but number two, but in my current work on ambition, I did not include that because that is just outright a political question. It's, it's not about individual ambition, it's really a state policy. And, but there's one thing related to uh, US and, uh, and uh, Europe. Um, in, you know, we think why the ethnic relations in China become more contentious and uh, more tense in China. If you look at this kind of what, what we can call outro uh, nationalists in China, they are very worried for Europe. They are very worried for the US. And they are worried for Europe, they say, oh, European states are too weak. You allowed so many Muslims coming into your own country. 
it is irresponsible because this Muslim population are irate, you know, uh, is is a uh, uh, challenging your European civilization. Basically, they support this ultra right wing politics in in Europe. I I'm sorry to say that is of course a minority, but there is a quite a vocal voice in China, and then they use that. You, I mean, this ultra-right discourse in Europe as an inter-referencing, but in a very uh, counterproductive way, to warn the Chinese society, to, see, to say, see, US, Europe now face a almost irresolvable social problem, which is ethnic conflict, which is identity crisis. We Chinese must do everything we can to avoid that. And this is how we can win. We can you know, beat the US and Europe by being stand very firmly, by protect our ethnic uh, 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 homogeneity. And that is, and then you look, it's not only about the ethnic relations. How do we understand why the policy towards Hong Kong also become much uh, 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 tougher after 2014? I mean, there's a specific reason. Uh, behind that, but a general trend is that the worry about identity fragmentation became very uh, over. I mean, really, it's 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 uh, overshadowing the Chinese public uh, thinking, um, at least among some population, which I must say is relatively new, because in socialist time, identity was not an issue. There was a you can say myth because you know we have this goal communism. I mean, we're all marching towards communism. I mean, you are Tibetan, and uh, oh, you are Uyghur, and uh, I'm E, ethnic minority. Why does this matter? We can sing together, we can dance together, we because, of, but doesn't matter because we have such a high level of ideal, shared ideal, together marching towards. And this identity is all become very sensitive. Uh, consideration. I think that's quite genuine. If you look at what happened in the 1950s and Cultural Revolution, that rather brutal suppression, but that's not specific for ethnic minorities. It is a, it's a carried out across the entire China. But now identity politics also became an issue and with lots of referencing to the West. Yeah, so that is something really need. To, so I think that is, we can say it is a collective battle how we can address identity politics in the West as well as in China. Well, I'm also not suggesting. Oh, we have a question. Yeah. Oh. Um, I'm a student from the political science department. I just want to, because I'm an ethnic minority from China, so I want to kind of um, uh, address your question about uh, ethnic conflict in China. I think like interreferencing Chinese ethnic problem with the U.S. is that the racial conflict in U.S. is d discrimination between racial groups, but in China the conflict is more as um, conflict between groups and the government instead of between in between groups. Because ethnically Han, which accounts for more than ninety percent of the population, I don't like from my personal experience don't discriminate against other ethnic minority groups and but the conflict that but we aware that the conflicts more of the, between the government and the local ethnic minorities thank you where what uh, was i <laughs> uh, yeah, perhaps um, um, a comment on, uh, uh, on, on race relations in America. Again, it harks back to what I said earlier. In the mid-20th century, most Americans who considered themselves liberal believed they were a democratic, liberal society that unfortunately had a quote-unquote Negro problem that was mostly the problem of backward Southerners and somehow had to be solved. And then you had all the uh, wonderful uh, civil rights uh, reforms of the 1960s, which were indeed an important historical caesura. 
but certainly did not bring uh, the kind of integrated society that, uh, that I think both the civil rights activists and the government envisioned and, and liberalism, racial liberalism envisioned at, um, at the time. So now what you have is a much more fragmented uh, society in which, I mean, we should not, this is not a, uh, the, the so-called race question or race relations in the United States uh, are not a bichromatic uh, conflict any longer in the sense that there are whites and non-whites. Uh, but there is a lot of ethnic competition. Asian Americans are often held up as the model minority. Um, just uh, something, because it, it's actually 30 years ago, The uh, I don't know, most of you in the audience are probably too young to remember this, but the, the infamous LA race riots, um, uh, which left more than 60 people uh, dead. It's mostly blacks and Hispanics ransacking Korean shops in, in, uh, in Southeast, uh, South Central uh, LA. So uh, uh, it is a, a fragmented uh, society in which uh, racial and ethnic minorities are competing for resources and influence and um, in a way, it's much, I, I, I would definitely agree, uh, this is America is a raw society, and these conflicts are much more out in the, op in the open. They're often very violent. This is nothing new. Uh, in the 19th century, Irish, German, ethnic neighborhoods were constantly clashing, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants killing, uh, killing patties and uh, whatnot. Um, so, um, but is it really a situation in which, I mean, this is what you've been, uh, what you talked about, these fears, again, as a historian, Hitler predicted the demise of, of the United States because it, it was racially diluted and would never be able to deal with the diversity. Well, he was wrong. Uh, we have the, the European right is united on that issue that uh, ethnic diversity will lead to decline. Uh, Russia is predicated on, uh, uh, Russia is, is the, the ideology of Putin has a lot to do and is inspiring the, uh, uh, the European far right in that uh, sense. Uh, again, my question would be, China has a serious demographic problem too particularly as far as the age structure of its population is uh, concerned. And the same holds true as far as I understand for Japan. Uh, the Germans for many, for many decades were in outright denial that they were a country of immigration up until maybe 20, 25 years ago. And now uh, even the mainstream, the majority in our country has accepted that we need uh, immigration in order to sustain the levels of economic growth and uh, welfare transfers uh, that has made life relatively comfortable here. So I wonder how China is dealing with that, uh, with that problem. It's a shortage of labor and as a population yeah. aging, yeah. So our, if we take Japan as a referencing point, then probably I can't imagine that China will really uh, adopt immigration uh, as a viable uh, uh, policy to address the, the declining of a working population. Uh, but my friend, can I ask a, a question? We go back to this uh, ethnic and racial relations on one hand and competition and ambition on the other hand. Can we say that the apparent very violent intergroup competition, the feelings that the intergroup, a different group are, are uh, competing over scarce resources actually is a, a reflection of some distorted intra-group competition. Uh, you alluded to that, right? You said, okay, so the white middle class are declining, but they don't think it is a system of competition, ambition, or meritocracy itself 
problematic. They think that the system probably is correct, but someone else, another group came in, still my, uh, my upset my, my, my game. And then we also have some counter examples to show that how uh, immigration itself does not create any uh, problem. Of course, I mean, the early stage of US development, if we put uh, the, the Indian population aside, uh, then you see, okay, that was, was uh, 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 immigration do not necessarily uh, lead to uh, massive social uh, unrest. And then you have Europe. After the war, after the Second World War, you have guest workers program, especially like if, I mean, Germany, of course, the guest worker program is controversial, but if you look at the Netherlands and look at the UK, 1960s, 50s, lots of workers came from South Asia, became, you know, factory workers, etc. If you look at documents now, hardly any mentioning of identity issue because they came not as Bangladeshi, or as a Pakistani, I definitely uh, 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 when, when uh, after, like say, 1970s, when, when the, the continent was uh, separated, they came as workers. So they came as workers, and then they found lots of things to talk about with Irish workers, with Italian workers. But it's only after 1990s, you no longer came as a worker. You came as a South Asian, you came as a Muslim, you came as a Hindu, and etc. Right? Uh, so, so that's that, that's the entire, and the, then the reason is why. Because I mean, I'm thinking the 1960s, 50s. I mean, there's a, the labor right and the social welfare and etc. So the individual desire to improve themselves do not manifest as kind of private ambition. And certainly is not supposed to be pursued through competition. Uh, so you come to join a collective. But when the game changed completely, you no longer join a collective for the collective good. You came as an individual and to, for your own private ambition. And you have to compete. And then when you feel frustrated, you turn back to your so-called cultural heritage. I have to find my dignity as being a Muslim. I ask Allah to help rather than I go I mean, organize a trade union, etc. Then the, 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 so the, in, the one hand, the people become much more competitive economically. But on the other hand, the people become ideological or religious, more frantic, right? So then you have this kind of, you can say, economic rationalization and the cultural irrationalization taking place at the same time. So I wonder whether, if you look at the U.S., whether or not this kind of intergroup conflict actually is a scapegoat or it's kind of just the outlet of a problem which actually originated from intergroup uh, resource distribution or competition. That's an that's an intriguing question. I mean, it, there's always been unacknowledged class conflict in the black community, uh, of course, uh, which was subdued as long as um, discriminatory practices and institutionalized uh, racism held sway. You could always argue that um, African Americans had basically the same interest in achieving practical equality uh, and opportunity. Uh, now, after the civil rights reforms in the 1960s, that begins to change. You have a growing black middle class and a middle class that is also um, moving away from uh, the confinements of, of inner city uh, ghettos. So you have growing class cleavages uh, within the black uh, within the black community. There's uh, uh, no question about that. Um, in terms of the breakup of social solidarity, I think what we really need to take into consideration, and I, I, I guess that's important worldwide, that what we see is the, uh, the changeover from the social democratic, in America it's known as the New Deal order uh, of the post-war period, the golden age, as Eric Hobsbawm has 
has dubbed it famously, to the neoliberal order. Um, in basically that began with the in U.S. with Reagan, the U.K. with Thatcher, and I wonder whether these identity issues are not tailor made for uh, the new uh, for this neoliberal uh, order. It's about self optimization. It's about you know fragmentation. It's about you find uh, yourself in your cultural, uh, uh, in your cultural uh, heritage. Also, I think the two very important in, in American society and in Western society at large, two very important cultural trends that have fueled uh, these developments. One is the so-called rights revolution, because the African uh, American civil rights movement just was a trigger to uh, basically unleash an avalanche of rights, of claims to rights and entitlements in American society. It was emulated not only by other ethnic groups, but also we have the women's rights movement, we have the gay rights movements and everything. That social claims are often articulated in rights. And I think that is something that is conducive to polarization in the sense that rights they have an aura of the sacred. If I have a right and you compromise my right, then that makes me a good person and it makes you a bad person. If we talk about interest, if we talk about material interest and the redistribution of money, maybe that's not uh, as important. And the other trend, I think, is about um, the validation of a victim culture. Uh, namely, we go back to historical grievances, we articulate, Western societies tend to articulate uh, problems, cleavages, and conflicts of the present in the language of grievances of the past. Uh, just one prominent example, uh, when you talk about reparations for slavery, that will send up many white Americans up the roof, particularly those who will argue, well, what do I have to do with slavery? My ancestors came from the shtetl through, El, uh, through Ellis Island in the early 20th century. I have nothing to do with, uh, with uh, slavery. Um, if you talk about equity, if you talk about economic, a uh, fairer economic deal, that's a, different, that's a different matter. So what we're having here is a culture of a hypermoralization in many uh, ways in American uh, society that I think uh, has to do with these two trends toward the rights revolution and towards, uh, uh, you know, um, an excessive um, dwelling on past grievances. Um, and again, I wonder uh, to what extent um, China is, uh, is, is immune against, uh, uh, are there any any skeletons in the closet in terms of, I, I think there should be, there, uh, uh, there should be. Yeah. No, that's a great question. First of all, I think the victim is extremely interesting. Of course, the Chinese nationalism is based on the notion that China is a victim, uh, is a you know, hundred years of humiliation and uh, this is number one. Number two is that the notion of victim at the individual level, if you have competition, you have failure. And then if you have failure, you're supposed to have victims. But I found it's quite interesting, the US culture is that you're not supposed to, at the individual level, you're not supposed to be victims. You can fail. Of course, in Silicon Valley, you know, it's a, it's a heroic act to fail. But fail, I immediately, you know, I, I, I reinvest and go uh, get more the, the investment from venture capitalists, etc. But you are not supposed to be a, a victim because that will be a, a, a admission of your own weakness, right? So that's interesting. Then you have this kind of historical narrative uh, redemption, almost a religious redemption, uh, readdress historical injustice on one hand. And but at the micro individual level, you are not supposed to be victim. So you are not supposed to say, I'm unhappy within this system. 
if you are unhappy, it's your own fault, right? Everyone should bounce back and try harder. <laughs> so that is an impossibility of create a space for victims, I think is a cause of a frustration. Because if you fail, you cannot really fail in a, it's a, it's a, 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 a gracious way. And that is a huge problem in China. China, there is everyone look up for quite a very small number of kind of homo culturally homogeneous role model. Uh, everyone want to go to you know, just basically two universities, 1.4 billion people only regard the two universities that really worth going. Uh, and then, but there is no space at the bottom for people who are not doing so well can have a peaceful and settled and content life. That's a, so the, 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 the problem is the, the, the impossibility of becoming victims. <laughs> so that's not. Two, the question about the, the right campaign. I really like the analysis because the right campaign agrees that essentialize lots of claims and then you just become a quasi-identity war rather than a negotiation of a social and economic uh, uh, relations. So then we have this trend, you know, individualize the right and create a formally, nominally, very equal society, but which fail to materialize in reality. I think that is another major cause of frustration, right? Because people say, I ought to be as rich as you, but, I, but of course we know it's impossible, so they can't explain that, of course, they get angry. But then at the same time, in China, China does not, not have that problem yet, the individualistic essentialized right discourse. But now we have another problem in China, is kind of, in Chinese, the bi shi lian, the chain of despise. Because you, 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 if you have competition, the whole point of competition is to differentiate, differentiate you from others. So in China, now you have very well established ladder of despise. Which city you look down, which city, I mean, it's a kind of humor, it's kind of supposed to be humorous, but, but you can see it's circulated. Which university you look down, which university, and in, in turn, right? it's a very, very long chain of differentiation and despising. And this is significant for me, and not only because it's ugly and problematic, but also, again, it related to the intergroup competition. Because once you have this private ambition, if it's un unregulated, raw private uh, uh, competition, you always need someone else come below you, right? Come to below you. So in China, because this ethnic relation is controlled in that way, so people normally don't like drag in, say, oh, the Tibetan is below me, because they think the Tibet, for the Han, Tibet is completely different category. Uh, they will think, oh, it's a troublemaker, et cetera, for, you know, according to the political uh, 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 position. But at least so within the Chinese society, you have urban rural divide, tier one city, tier two, tier three, tier four, tier five. and then you have university also tier one, tier two. So then always constantly create that kind of, 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 of uh, 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 differentiation, which actually is not a, uh, objective reaction, a reflection of objective inequality, but it is a more mental, cultural construction of different categories in order to put someone else below me. And that actually is a very, create lots of uh, mental stress. If you are, you know, find out that you come from tier four city and now you're going to tier three university, your life is very hard. 不要像, just, just to say, this is Arcuism. This is Arcuism, right? Arq was this, this figure in, in a story by Lu Xun, right? Who, who would always win, even though he was a loser, a complete loser, right? Because then he would declare himself, for example, he, he, he loses in, in, in a boxing situation, right? And then, then he sort of he declares himself the best loser. So then he is the best. And so then he's the winner again. And stuff like that. So, I, what you are describing is that acuism in the 21st century? Yeah, because I want the solution. Yeah, yeah. But now people are too sober. Uh, Maybe we should open the, the, the discussion to the audience. I'm sure we have quite a few questions. There's one over there.
Thank you, Professor Xiang, and thank you, Professor Beck, for this wonderful conversation. Um, my question is, um, is it possible to understand the rivalry between the states and China in a um, much longer uh, tradition? So as part of this kind of uh, racial tension in the states, uh, this kind of anti-Chinese or anti-Asian racism uh, in, in the states, because we know um, back in the uh, Republican era, there was uh, this um, notorious Chinese figure, Fu Manchu, uh, which kind of represents this yellow peril figure. And then later, um, um, we have like other like a real uh, historical figures like Qian Xuesen, uh, which uh, was uh, like famous uh, scientist uh, who uh, studied in the States during the Qing uh, dynasty. And later in the in the 90s, we have uh, Taiwanese American um, Wen Ho Li, uh, which uh, was accused for being spy and trade on information with the Chinese government. And now we have Chen Gang, another famous scientist from MIT. So there are like uh, um, a huge uh, amount of uh, Chinese or like Asian figures uh, in American history became the target of discrimination and harassment. Um, so it, it kind of goes beyond uh, being a, a Chinese national or being uh, um, a Chinese communist. So is it possible to understand this kind of um, uh, conflict between China and the states uh, as part of the larger uh, yellow peril ideology? Uh, so that's my question. And also, uh, I mean, if we look at it that way, um, so the individual differences between those figures are kind of blurred because they're all kind of labeled as the, um, the Asian American in the states. Um, so um, that's kind of my question to uh, like for, for the two professors. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, I think, of course, as a, as a historian, I'm inclined to uh, take uh, um, a look back at the 19th century here and uh, point out that um, Chinese immigrants were the most despised and most discriminated against group of uh, immigrants uh, ever. Uh, there's tremendous mob violence, there's the Chinese Exclusion Act, they were labeled as aliens not eligible for citizenship. Uh, so there is a tremendous racism against, um, uh, against Asians in general and uh, Chinese uh, in uh, particular. On the other hand, you have this very positive image of Chinese and Asians being a model uh, minority of being actually the one minority that embraces the individualistic American dream. I just mentioned that Harvard uh, lawsuit, very economically very successful, in fact, too successful for the taste of uh, many whites. I just very recently read a statistics according to which uh, Asian Americans have surpassed um, Euro Americans in average income. Uh, so you can expect some resentment here. At the political level, I think there are just ups and downs. And uh, we have periods in American history when particular uh, ethnic groups are suspected of being illoyal. Uh, just to mention the anti-German hysteria during World War I, the Japanese internment in, uh, uh, during the Second World War, um, so I would not be surprised if Chinese scientists in particular or salient uh, Chinese Americans uh, uh, figures uh, become targets of such uh, resentment. And on the other hand, I would like, be before sounding too negative and dystopian here, um, what I've always admired about American society is its ability to deal with uh, puzzling diversity with all these conflicts. To me, the uh, the miracle about America has never been that it is the great um, society where the American dream is attainable for everyone. I mean, of course, that's a myth. I've always been wondering why a society that is so diverse in ethnic, religious, um, political persuasions, whatnot, does not break apart. Now, of course, that may be an open question uh, in this year of 2023. Uh, but uh, in that sense, I would, I would argue uh, the Chinese experience is not singular or uh, unique, but is generally within the mainstream of American history. 
Yeah, just a quick uh, a response. I think uh, absolutely what you said is true. Uh, but I coming from China, I feel uh, this narrative is important to be aware, but I also feel has its limit because such a narrative, in such a narrative, only the Americans are subject because they discriminate others. So the Chinese are silent victims. Then I always wonder, what do the Chinese think? Why do they go to the US? How do they react? Don't you also discriminate Africans? <laughs> Don't you are also very chauvinist? Don't you also do all the horrible things? And Chinese are very capable of doing terrible things, just like Americans. This is an agency. It's in order to, 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 to put the Chinese down or up, I mean, just to, to be. But this, this, there is a, a narrative self-orientalizing, or, you know, so, so we, we, we are very nice Asians and always bullied. And, uh, but, uh, but what's your contribution to the world? I mean, actually, we have lots of contribution. But then I go back to the question, what you mentioned, the resilience of the US. This go back to the global economy question. I am worried about, in this regard, about the American uh, future. Uh, I, I do feel that the problem in the US is arguably deeper than the problem in China. One reason is that the US have always been able to solve its internal problem through externalization. It's a global hegemonic position, cannot be ignored. You know, if we have some economic problem, why print more US dollars? I mean, if people don't use US dollars, I send the worship. And if people say, oh, you should not do any uh, uh, the military intervention here and there, and of course, I can create a certain regional conflict. Uh, and uh, and uh, uh, it's, it has been, I mean, it's not a moral judgment, but, but, but the US has been extremely skillful, I think, playing a, a, as a global figure and as an unquestioned global hegemony based on US dollars, based on military power, based on the control of energy in Middle East and Latin America. In my view, is the main reason why domestic issues can be dealt with or at least can be postponed temporarily. Why now China becomes such a huge problem for the US? It is, I can understand why US elite feel it is existential because the space suddenly becomes so much smaller than they are used to. Uh, but I must say the China, the Chinese country leader are doing really, I just, it's beyond my apprehension. For me, it's just completely stupid. All this, uh, it's, 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 it cannot be justified on any tactical, strategic or moral uh, ground. But anyway, that, but, but, they, but that can make go away, but there's a long game long game is probably US will lose its global space. Then if US lose global space, I think the domestic problem could become very serious and whether or not there will be a major revolution change, I don't know. Well, there are certainly uh, disquieting signs uh, as far as the stability of uh, U.S. democracy is concerned. I think we all saw that during the Trump era and the um, uh, the storm on the Capitol two years ago. There's a lot of literature now on whether the United States are facing another civil war. Uh, and though that may sound alarmist, uh, I personally think that there are certain indications uh, that usually pre-civil war societies display. As far as the, first of all, I think it, is all, it should also be added to the equation that you were just mentioning that the U.S. in fact is also a very innovative uh, economy and society, that it attracts a lot of talent from the rest of the world uh, and, in that, and, and that is also a major factor uh, in why it is an, uh, an economic uh, superpower. Uh, but as far as I have observed that the, the economic deal between China and the United States since maybe the 1980s onward, it was based on, and China was playing a role that was crucial 
to neoliberal policies. Uh, cutbacks of the welfare state, cut back state uh, authority in, in general, deregulation. Uh, the middle, the incomes of the middle class were stagnating why, while the, the hyper-rich really creamed off uh, almost the lion's share of, of growth rates. Why then could the American middle class uh, sustain, to the extent that it could, sustain uh, its standard of living? Because there were cheap imports from China. And because, the, because China was willing to, well, to put it bluntly, to take checks from the United States without cashing them in. And uh, I wonder how long that economic arrangement uh, is uh, still tenable, uh, particularly, I think, and, and this is one of the, the major lessons that we need to draw from the Ukraine war. We cannot just think in terms of the primacy of, of economics. Uh, we need to accept that there are leaders who have goals in which economic considerations take a back seat. Uh, and uh, I wonder, I mean, I've read this so often. Well, there's never going to be a major conflict between China and the United States because it would be economic disaster, economically disastrous to both of them. Well, yes, it would be. But does it really mean you have rational actors uh, uh, at the helm? Uh, but I think uh, it is important to understand that the, the internal stability of the United States uh, since the 1980s to a considerable extent was dependent on its economic relationship with China. 